Okay, guys, let's get started. Um, so uh, welcome on our webinar. That is Hacker's Perspective, Risks and Solution where I'm working from home. And during this webinar, uh, we're going to cover different aspects that are related with the remote work. And this is something that, of course, we're going to give you some stats and so on. But this is the uh, issue that is um, a concern for everybody. Therefore, uh, we would like to give you uh, different types of perspectives, starting with attacks. We wouldn't be secure team if we uh, did not start with the attacks, right, guys? Uh, and um, and then we're going to cover different types of solutions. Well, this webinar is covered also with different types of tips that you can implement in order to have a safe uh, remote uh, work. And it's not only related with the bring your own device uh, perspective, because sometimes we just have a corporate laptop at home, but we're going to also cover that scenario. So working from your device, working from a corporate laptop. So different types of aspects uh, related with that. Okay, anyway, let's start. So if you don't mind, um, I will do a little bit of a housekeeping. Actually, I really enjoy doing this. So sorry, guys, let me do that. And uh, eventually I'll do a bit of an introduction. So maybe um, uh, I will start actually from myself. Maybe this is not very pleasant, but since I'm the one uh, having a microphone, uh, let us let me do this. So as you can see on the site, I'm Paula Januszkiewicz and I'm the CEO of uh, Secure. And uh, long story short, uh, I'm in business for the past 15 years dealing with cybersecurity issues. Uh, and I wouldn't be where we are right now if it wasn't uh, the team. So uh, let me introduce you my Mike Jankowski Lorek. So, Mike, uh, if you don't mind mentioning something about yourself, that'll be great. So, uh, hello, I'm uh, Mike Jankowski Lorek. I'm the um, director of consulting at Secure, and um, I'm a trainer, cybersecurity expert, penetration tester, uh, doing lots of things, <laughs> really. Uh, but I really enjoy uh, combining uh, cybersecurity with machine learning slash artificial intelligence because this is the future of our uh, protection that we have here. And right now, focusing mostly on the identity solutions, which a couple of those will be also covered this uh, presentation. Awesome. Thanks so much. And we've got Arthur. The yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So I'm the guy responsible for breaking stuff. So uh, I'm a red teamer. So I search for vulnerabilities uh, in our customers' uh, services, infrastructure. So this is uh, what I do. And I also provide trainings like uh, this one. So this is my, let's say, my role in the secure. Uh, the, the guy that breaks stuff, this is a pretty nice description. You, you break pretty much to all of the uh, things that we test. So uh, <laughs> so this is something important to mention. And Arthur today will also show you how uh, hackers can get inside uh, someone's desktop when performing remote work. And we've got Miłosz. Hello, nice to meet you. Um... I am cybersecurity expert at Secure, uh, involved both in trainings and consulting services. I'm helping others to break stuff and to teach others how to break stuff. And yeah, I will show you a um, few interesting things today. Hope you will enjoy it. Goodness, so we're all breaking stuff and uh, technically we all do penetration tests, even though we've got uh, also different functions at our company. Uh, so let me move forward because there's a lot of subjects to be covered uh, today. So uh, just a few words about our team. So you already know that we are breaking stuff, but eventually our t our team, our company is in the market for uh, the past 11 years. So cybersecurity is in our minds and hearts because uh, that's what we do pretty much every day. And it's also part of our hobby. And and uh, not only we do pen tests, uh, but we also perform incident response, but we also do the good stuff uh, that is related with implementation of various solutions that support cybersecurity. So at the end, someone needs to write a reasonable report after the pen test and it needs to come from the practice. And that's basically what we do. We also do R&D. Um, including, for example, um, data protection API, world node research. We're the only team that reverse engineered cryptographic platform in Windows. So we are happy to share all of the tools and so on uh, on our blog, but uh, 
being a geek, basically, we're going to share all the links uh, with you at the end of this webinar, um, so um, so that you are able to learn more in the subject we share knowledge on our blog so you are able to find over there different types of interesting videos okay anyway our team looks like this so this is our core team um and um as you see i mean pretty pretty uh, nice uh, group of pals but uh, at the end uh, of course not everybody everybody is super tech savvy um not everybody is performing consulting but most of us are and even though um someone is um working not directly with uh, pen testing and so on these guys too are actually uh cyber security minded so a uh, very very nice um group of geeks so um Whenever we are thinking, of course, about our webinar, so there's a couple of things that you need to guys follow in order to assure a good quality of your experience. And uh, the reason why uh, we are mentioning this is because sometimes, especially right now, when we've got different types of situations with internet access being slow and so on, that's something that you need to know. Uh, we've been, for example, doing a bunch of tests for this webinar um, today, and it took us four hours to figure out the optimal solution for us to uh, use in order to make sure that everything works correctly and without any like lagging and so on. This is what we all hate during um, the calls. So hopefully that won't happen on our call because it's a live webinar. Uh, but eventually, um, please let us know if there is something we can do for you. And that's info at secureacademy.com. We are monitoring this email. And if you cannot connect, there's something wrong and so on, just let us know and then we're going to help you. Uh, there might be also a possibility to contact us on Facebook. We're very active over there. You can also refresh the page and so on. So all these classic things that we normally do, we're all in IT when attending different types of calls, especially because it's a web platform, it's a little bit easier for us to, to mitigate that. So um, this is pretty much what we're going to be dealing with now. Uh, also, if there is going to be any problem, we've got a backup for you. So um, we're going to launch the backup scenario while the problem appears. So eventually you're going to get your portion of knowledge. And that's what we really care about. So this is basically uh, the, the setup. Um, OK, so. What can you expect today? Well, basically, there is a live Q&A uh, with us. So you were able to ask different types of questions uh, during the uh, webinar. We're going to handle them uh, after the webinar and so on. So you can expect this conversation going. So there's a chat possibility. So please uh, do not hesitate to do that. And eventually, every kind of tool that we are using over here that is also an our tool and so on you'll be able to find on our blog and uh, that's really exciting because we've got over 200 tools that we've written and uh, lots of lots of cool things uh, so um, yeah absolutely we are happy to share uh, those with you and uh, we always do that by the way after various conferences so after this webinar especially after this webinar you will be able to access those uh okay so it's time to start but before we do that uh since we've got a like home office i'm sure you guys noticed that there is something like weird <laughs> happening here so this is our like home office team blouse um hopefully um <laughs> arthur isn't home that's why so here we go. Um, so um, so hopefully you feel comfortable, get yourself a drink, um, whatever you've got over there, and uh, it's time to get a nice portion of knowledge for the next uh, over upcoming hour. So let's do that. So at that moment, um, we will switch off our cameras um, and then let's focus purely on the content. Uh, and at the end, you're going to see us back again when we're going to be performing the summary. So let me turn the video off. Here we go. Thank you. And let's start. So, um, well, we, we can see right now that we are dealing with a situation with um, the coronavirus and it's not really a presentation about that, so don't worry. But eventually, um, as workplaces across the whole world look to adapt to um, to the pro to, to the need uh, to uh, to slow the transmission of the virus, uh, lots of different types of uh, employers uh, are 
seeking for solutions to enable the remote work to um, employees. So it could be in general a connection through VPN, it could be a connection through remote desktop connection and so on. So different, different options, yes. And in general, we have to have a possibility to share our data with everybody else. We have to have a possibility to communicate. And that's why we have to uh, right now turn into scenario where we are actually uh, doing the the remote uh, remote work, um, so to say, home office, but it doesn't have to be, of course, from home. But eventually, lots of different companies, uh, let's say Google, Amazon, and so on, they are already prepared um, for the needs of a remote workforce. Microsoft has lots of different solutions. They also have a home office and so on, so they are also prepared for that. But for the other companies, uh, while we are um, uh, thinking about the remote work, then this is pretty much a quite a big challenge. So in order to make sure that everybody is safe out there, we have to uh, take into consideration not only the reliability of solutions that we are using, but also we need to make sure that cybersecurity is there as well. So whenever we are thinking about different types of uh, statistics, and we're going to be sharing those with you at the very beginning because we find them extremely interesting, even though it's a technical uh, webinar, um, we've got the very famous International Workplace uh, Group report. Everybody's quoting that right now. And these guys say that 50% of employees, they're working outside of their main office for at least two and a half days per week. So we're kind of used to this. Now, the challenge is that uh, whenever we are supposed to sit all the time at home, there is no option to come back, for example, to the office and to sync up our data or to prepare something at home and come back to the office and upload the data over there. But we have to actually have the remote communication all the time. So eventually, um, different types of companies are scrabbling for solutions but at the end, we have to still remember that cybersecurity is a quite an important thing over here uh, to implement. So uh, when I was looking uh, through different types of recommendations that were given by even government agencies, what I found is that uh, Department of Homeland Security Cyber Agency, so that's the CISA, so Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, they have issued a very interesting alert that is encouraging organizations to uh, take some steps, take some approach into cybersecurity. And eventually, um, they mentioned different types of possibilities of increased vulnerabilities, different types of attacks, phishing attempts, and so on. And whenever we look at some other even researchers, not only these guys, but for example, Checkpoint, uh, they also mentioned within their report that different cyber criminals are using coronavirus uh, to spread the different types of spam activity. Um, it could be through email campaign, it could be through malicious domains, it could be through some even donations, which is absolutely awful, but uh, still this is what we see is happening. So eventually this is this is quite a big challenge over here, especially when you are uh, working from home, not always you have a possibility to maybe quickly consider what to do uh, and also when we're looking at this from the perspective of employer where we have to make sure that that kind of communication does not really get into employees using either their home computers or work computers so this is also quite a big challenge so, so what we are trying to say over here is that that particular uh, rapid shift uh, to uh, remote work without well-established protocols, procedures, and so on, will most possibly create even more opportunities for different types of attacks. So if you are at the moment right now where you are implementing remote work for your employees, or you are trying to uh, become familiar with different types of risks, that is definitely uh, a webinar for you. And uh, in this webinar, we will show you, of course, different types of uh, attacks related with the remote work. So uh, let's look at the different types of situations and statistics that are related with remote work to show you basically what and how many uh, different types of devices are uh, right now participating in the communication to um, support remote work. But first, 
we've got a bit of requirements. So in order to have a remote work, so whether you were in travel or you were having a home office and so on, when we logically look at that situation, there's a couple of things to take into consideration. One of these is, of course, the possibility to share data with other users. So we have to have a way of doing it. Now, the reason why we put that in the slide is that it's because if we don't have a solution or a platform where our employees are able to cooperate, they'll find a way because everybody wants to do their job, uh, especially right now, we've got a different situations. Some of the some of the guys are not in a good situations because maybe they're like one person company or they're contractors and so on. So everybody wants to work right now uh, to make sure that we've got that, uh, that uh, momentum uh, and we don't lose it because of the situation that is happening in the world. So that's why we will even more try to figure out different ways uh, to uh, cooperate with each other. That means that um, if that particular platform doesn't exist or if it doesn't work, then users will start, for example, sharing data on their mobile devices or using any other ways that uh, sometimes we couldn't even imagine, but they will figure out the way of doing it. Eventually, we've got to, or we need to have a VPN. And uh, that is very clear. But the question is, of course, how do we connect to this VPN? We're going to talk about that. Do we have a multi-factor authentication for a VPN? Because, for example, if either from corporate laptop or home laptop, we are connecting to the network, then still you are inside the network. So you, you are bringing all of the threats to the organization, which we're going to be talking about this because if you are connecting from the home network, for example, there might be, for example, and Arthur has a great demonstration for you, by the way, you might have applications that are vulnerable and these applications might be a really interesting trigger to attack different types of services through a VPN network. And that's, by the way, what we call shadow IT. We're going to mention this in a moment. But access to business application is also a critical aspect over here. So whenever we are thinking about all these concerns, I well, we put over here on the slide lots of different things. Um, so try to try to have a look. Um, there's a lot of concerns eventually. But one of the major concerns, it's a shadow IT scenario. And shadow IT is in general the situation where we manage different types of IT services in our in our organization. But it appears that eventually there has been one solution set up at hoc. And another one has been there because we had to be quick. And another one has been reconfigured because it wasn't working. So we had to introduce different types of changes to it. They were eventually were not reported anywhere. And uh, we've got a problem right now because this particular app is vulnerable. We don't even know about that because we think the state of it is different. And eventually that could be overused within these attacks. So we're going to show you the attack that is related with, with that. And eventually, uh, whenever we've got VPNs that are 24 H, um, and um, th this is something that we, we don't kind of like accept the shutdown. So that also might be a problem. Yeah? So that's why we're going to recommend you at the end, but it's going to be a big list of recommendations that one of the things to do is to verify if your VPN software that you're using and different types of devices are actually up to date. Because not really long time ago, with different types of vendors, there were vulnerabilities announced that allow you, for example, to well, sometimes perform the remote code execution, which is one of the worst attacks out there. And eventually, increased phishing emails. So even though we've got a, for example, customer that was claiming that they've got three anti-spam, anti-phishing filters. But if you prepare a phishing email smart enough, uh, well enough, then eventually that email goes through. And I'm sure you've been wondering many times, like how how is it possible that we've got all these great solutions, but all these phishing emails or some of them eventually uh, they come through. Uh, well, that is because uh, they were designed in a way to bypass these filters. And that is also something that we would like to show you because that is also a concern. So this is the moment where we might rely on our employees to make sure um, that the security is is um, still still maintained. Uh, eventually, whenever we are thinking about multi-factor authentication, this is also a concern. And we're going to start with an attack, and that's going to be my role to show you how you are able to perform the uh, RDP password spray. 
So for example, it could be also related with the VPN and so on. So um, that does not support multi-factor authentication so that you are able to connect with the different usernames and different passwords, something that is predictable in order to uh, connect to the company. Not really long time ago, I was actually doing the pen test for organization actually together with Arthur and Mike was doing that later on and Miwosh was also engaged. So uh, interesting team uh, to have on a webinar that is related with the same customer. So this is like an oil and gas company and approximately 6,000 uh, employees. And what we did, we have, uh, we've done just simply uh, password spraying and 29 out of uh, that amount of users, uh, people uh, had a um, password that was company name and that was just at the end of the year 2019. So it was a 2019, yeah? So XYZ 2019, which I know it sounds like a boring cliche, but eventually, that is something that will be an attack right now because what is VPNs, what is possible remote access, If even though they were not available before, they're going to open right now to make sure that we've got the appropriate level of productivity. And eventually, it might be also the problem with um, the, the personnel. So this also leads us to make shortcuts. So someone might not be able to help you at that moment because this person is not available um whatever the situation is happening there but it's not available so we can expect that so that's why different shortcuts might open the doors for uh, various threats so whenever we think about the shadow it uh, let's give it a bit of a focus because this is a big concern so eventually shadow it these are different types of solutions, services, and so on that were introduced out of uh, compliance. So that sounds very official, right? But uh, with our own words, that means that these are services that were introduced uh, because we needed them, because uh, because it's possible, and so on. And eventually, they might present this shadow layer of threats that we do not know about while, or if we do not, for example, perform penetration tests. Now, Interesting fact is, I would say that pretty much every single time we do the pen test for the companies, when we discover something, then we inform the IT team about that. And then the IT team is like, oh, we didn't even know that, that such a thing even exists. And I've been in many situations like this during my pen test that uh, I, I mentioned this to the administrators and then they are like, oh, so there is like a SQL server well, that is misconfigured, uh, which password, for example, can be guessed and so on. So this is, of course, extremely simple, but it could be, for example, uh, different like web applications that could be used by developers. So different web servers that might be using for testing. And then these web servers, they are not managed. They are not updated. And this is how, for example, Arthur, not a really long time ago, managed to get access to our customers' location where uh, you were able to uh, connect through a malicious uh, web app, uh, not malicious, but a vulnerable web app. And then eventually we're able to become a local system. And this was a, our point of entry to move further within the pandas. Yeah? So, so this is basically shadow IT. Now, whenever we think about that, of course, let's don't get too much into this uh, naming convention, but, but that's something that functions out there, that shadow IT in general it, it includes all of these services that we don't know about that are actually um, exposing some kind of a risk. But eventually there's also shallow IT where we've got an um, centralized uh, IT management. When we do pen tests, when we, for example, see what's happening, it could be, for example, done by internal teams, simply speaking, to verify what kind of services we actually got them, uh, got there. And uh, that involves also non-critical systems, which means we also test these tiny things. So IoT and some other other solutions that might be uh, potentially a threat for us. So whenever we think about remote work by the numbers, We've got 81% um, guys that um, use a personal electronic device for work-related functions. So that could be a laptop, it could be a, a mobile phone, and so on. And as you see, some other statistics over here, they're also quite interesting. It doesn't mean that it has to be uh, necessarily BYOD, so bring your own device. Uh, but in general, the situation where we are accessing a company's data from our um, personal device that most probably isn't managed. So this is also a bit of a threat. And the reason why we are presenting the statistics, because we would like to show you how if, for example, there is a home users or personal in general device connecting 
to the remote services that are published by the company could be actually a threat over here. Yeah. So this is this is going to be a very realistic scenario out there. We we thought that through, and eventually, uh, whenever we are thinking about uh, some other perspectives, so what types of devices we are actually using uh, for for that type of work, and then we've got a desktop PC, so typically a work um, or a home computer. We've got laptops. It could be corporate or not, but eventually, since we are discussing here on uh, the personal bring your own device thing, then it's going to be our personal laptop smartphone and so on so so these types of devices are the ones where the threat um can come through and eventually what is interesting is that for um most of the devices that we are actually using over here we are reconsidering the regular pcs so we've got a desktop computers or eventually the laptop computers and for those we've got the bigger amount or the biggest amount of threats um so that um so that that could be also potentially a problem for the remote work and eventually uh, whenever we are thinking about the types of devices that store company information we've got a desktop and laptop so in general the the pc uh, for uh, processing corporate information and that is also a problem by considering um the platform that we are using for uh, for our work. So uh, we know that mobile devices in general could expose at that moment um, percentage-wise a little bit lower threat, but it's not that low still, but desktops and laptop computers uh, are the highest. And uh, eventually the statistic here, um, whenever we are thinking about the other perspective, so what does uh, IT, uh, what do IT professionals respond um uh, to whenever we are thinking about the remote work and eventually this uh 65 percent i would say it's the most interesting statistic here because 65 percent of guys they say they do not have the necessary tools in place to manage non-company issued mobile devices on the network so we've got a problem that is right now um making the whole circle where we are using different types of devices working from home that are, are that belong to us and eventually we've got IT personnel that claims that there isn't much they can do about it right now. So fantastic from the hacker's perspective and that, that's basically what we're going to be talking about. So let's summarize. Whenever we are thinking about um, remote work, yes, yeah, so working even from your own device, but not like this, we should always assume the worst, meaning uh, assume that user is actually storing data, corporate data on that device. Assume that user has malware on that device. So question is, what happens next? So when I connect, for example, with that device to the network, can I eventually, uh, or am I eventually well, some kind of a risk or not? What could I do? How much could I spread? If I lose a device that's my personal device with a corporate data, will this data still be accessible? So these are the things that are a bigger threat right now because we've got eventually a situation that we all uh, are in. So this is the moment where we're going to switch to attacks and scenarios. And we're going to start with the first attack, uh, which is a remote desktop attack. So uh, that's simple scenario to warm you up a little bit, an evolved situation where we've got uh, um, a momentum uh, where uh, someone is trying to assure remote work for remote users. And these guys say, OK, so since we don't have a solution right now, what we're going to do, we're going to set up for you a, an RDP connection. And that particular RDP connection, let me share the screen with you, uh, basically allows us to perform different types of password spraying attacks. And actually, when you look for different types of tools from the hacker's perspective in order to perform the RDP password spray, then there's like tons of them. So I would like to actually show you two. Why not? So one is called the RDP, um, RD, RD pass spray, and it's in Python. And eventually, uh, I'm to shorten the whole demonstration. I'm here targeting a specific username and password. We could use here a dictionary file. But if you are 
um, eager to see the dictionary file, this is be, uh, my second demo for you, where I'm going to be using the crowbar, where I do have actually a dictionary file, which I'm going to be targeting for administrator's account. Now, you might be wondering why administrator's account. Well, because in most cases, for this administrator's account, you do not have the threshold for the passwords. So you can try as many times as you want, and eventually this account will not be locked. But it, of course, varies from organization to organization. That's why we are mentioning this particular risk. So let's start with the easy part. So over here, I'm using Python 3, RD, um, RD pass spray, and so on to specify that particular uh, user. And it's trying uh, this, the various username and a password. And eventually, it says, Cred successful. Yeah, so you're able to see that. Eventually, I was logged on over here, but that locked me because eventually I logged on through remote desktop connection. So this is also a bit of a small confirmation for you to see that I'm actually logging on to this particular computer. Now, another demonstration over here, it's related with the crowbar. So as you see, we've got a crowbar in Python and we are using the brute force attack for RDP protocol. And I'm specifying the username administrator at the domain, for example, with the capital C where I'm specifying over here the pass list txt file and that is the password that contains the dictionary with the passwords and I'm specifying which server this should attack. It always takes a little bit of time so you have to be patient as an attacker but eventually maybe that could be part that could be a password which is related with um, dictionary who knows. And as you can see, we managed to log in, the desktop is locked, and we've got an RDP success, administrator secure, and so on. Now, interesting thing is, is it with the uh, network level authentication um, turned on? Yes, it is. So basically, over here, uh, this is with the NLA turned on. So this is, I mean, it doesn't really matter because these tools understand that, that's my point. Uh, and uh, that could be a potential threat. So what's the solution for this? Well, it would be nice to have some kind of a multi-factor authentication. Yep, uh, we're gonna be talking about this later on. Um, eventually it could be um, some gateway that we could connect through in order to authenticate further. Uh, but at that moment, uh, we are able to attack this organization and manage to get access to um, someone's desktop, so to say. So this is the first threat to manage. Now let's get into scenarios. So Arthur uh, is gonna show you a really interesting scenario, complete scenario of the attack from the home user perspective, where you'll be able to see how hacker, hacker actually uh, operates. So um, Arthur, back to you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Paula. Okay, so in this scenario, we will um, talk about the case when our employee is using his home computer, and this home computer is also used by uh, other members of his family. So, for example, um, also he has kids who are playing games and are using uh, the um, computer to browse the internet. <clears throat> so uh, in this case, there is a lot of risks uh, that I would like to talk about. So let me share my screen. There it is. Okay, so I hope uh, you can see it well. And uh, yeah, so in this case, on the left, we have the attacker's machine. And on the right, we have the victim's machine, a personal computer in the home network that is used by our employee and his uh, family members. So um, our employee is using uh, tools such as uh, WNS CP. So this is a tool that is used to connect uh, to SFTP, SSH, and, and other uh, similar services. And as you can see, the root password uh, is saved here to our corporate uh, server. And now, so let's see some other uh, applications. Uh, we can see that there is also um, M Remote NG. So this is a tool uh, which can be used to manage the connections to RDP services, uh, such as uh, Paula was talking about. And also here you can uh, save uh, all the credentials for your uh, internal infrastructure. Um, what else? Uh, we can see that there are some uh, browsers and also there is a, a GOG Galaxy platform. This was a software probably installed by the children of our employee. So this is a platform similar to Steam. 
uh, where we can buy games, install games. Yeah, so this is a typical home uh, computer. Uh, okay, so let's say that our employee is um, opening uh, emails uh, on this computer. So it's like a pretty common scenario. And as you can see, there was a malicious email sent to our victim and the hacker was using the sqdemo.net domain, which is similar to our corporate domain, which is cqdemo.pro. And uh, as you can see, um, the cyber criminal is saying that there is something really urgent and to do for our employee because our CEO is asking for it. So it must be something really, really important. Okay, so let's say that our employee opens such email and opens such link. And as you can see, there is an Excel spreadsheet um, that could be opened. So let's open it. Um, yeah, okay, so as you can see, and there is a warning that this file is um, running in protected uh, mode. However, as always, uh, many people don't take too much attention to the warnings. So um, probably uh, our employee could accept this warning. So let's accept it. Uh, we have another warning about the macros in this um, in this Excel file. So let's also accept this warning because we want to know what's going on here. And th in this case, um, there is an image in the background. So wherever we click here, a macro will be um, run. So let's see what this macro um, does. Uh, let me check. Yeah, so this is and the details of the macro. And as you can see, this is a really simple uh, script and that is running a PowerShell process. And um, the following code will be executed with PowerShell. This is uh, our reverse shell code that we uh, prepared, which is, I think, one of the shortest shell codes um, in PowerShell. It's about 200 characters long. And what would this code do? is that it will connect back to our attacker. And by that, we will be able to um, take over the PowerShell session. So, okay, so let's check how, how we can do that. So the victim will be connecting to our attacker on port 443. And um, because this is a port uh, that is uh, usually uh, opened, um, in the companies and in, in, in secure networks and so on. So this is a popular one. Um, okay, so let's close this macro. And at the only beginning, let's start a listener. So let's start a Metasploit fr framework. And we will use the Metasploit framework because um, it's much more convenient to manage the sessions because uh, we will get more than one session here. Uh, okay, and now if we have the um, Metasploit framework, framework opened, now let's start the listener. So uh, we will start the um, reverse TCP shell uh, listener uh, on port 443, and we will run it in a background. So in the background, we have a process that is listening on port 443. And now let's try to uh, run the macro. So we are clicking something somewhere here. And as you could see, the attacker actually got the session to our victim. So let's communicate with the session. And so this is a session number one. And let's check who are we, right? So who am I? Uh, and as you can see, we are a user on this machine, a regular user. We don't have any administrative privileges right now. However, in this case, um, if, for example, a ransomware was able to take over uh, this account, then the ransomware could encrypt the files, all the files this user has access to. 
um, such as, uh, for example, yeah, so th these are the files, for example, that could be encrypted by ransomware. And after that, there could be a warning that you have to pay a bunch of money and to get your files decrypted. Or there is also a new approach recently that is used by ransomware. So there is a warning that all the files that were um, able to download uh, will be published uh, on, on the internet after like a three weeks um, if the, there is no payment uh, for the ransom. So uh, yeah, so this is a huge risk, especially for the companies. Um, uh, but uh, we can't uh, actually get access to other users' uh, files, so, such as let's say there is an admin user, so we don't have access to the files of this administrator. However, we could perform other malicious um, actions. Uh, for that, we can use the post-exploit uh, framework that we prepared. So in this case, we will download our uh, library, PowerShell um, scripts library um, straight to the memory so no files will be created on the um, victim's drive. So the scripts are loaded and now we can provide some uh, malicious actions such as taking screenshots of our victim uh, so and uh, upload it to our uh, attacker's machine. So let's take the screenshot of our victim. And as you can see, there is a new file um, on the server, and this is a screenshot of our victim. So we can see what our employee is doing. And now let's uh, do some uh, more malicious actions. And so we could also uh, record the keystrokes. So let's say that um, that we have, uh, so our employee is trying to log in to our uh, corporate email inbox. And let's say that our attacker is listening to the keystrokes. So everything that our victim writes with his keyboard is sent back to the attacker. So in this case, we will be uh, listening for the key keystrokes for about 20 seconds. So let's start the script and let's try to log in with the following um, email uh, credentials. So we have the username and the very difficult password. Okay, and now let's see if the victim um, was victim's password was compromised. Yes, it was. Yes, so this way we were able to capture the password of our victim, uh, and it was also uploaded to our attacker's um, machine. Okay, so this is um, the next thing that we can do, but that's not all. Um, as we said before, there are a lot of tools that store passwords, so we could try to extract those passwords. So now let's try to uh, use the uh, lasagna tool. So in this case, we will download the lasagna tool uh, from uh, our attacker server to our victim's uh, temporary directory. So let's download it. It will take quite a while. And after that, um, we can use this tool to extract uh, credentials to which our victim user um, is allowed to. So, um, so yeah, so we will use the all parameter to extract all credentials available to this user. And this is going to take a while. And after that, uh, we could gather a lot of interesting uh, information uh, that could be used by the attacker in further attacks for our on our infrastructure. So as we said, 
uh, there are some uh, information that some uh, the passwords for company Wi-Fi and home Wi-Fi are saved on our wo workstation. However, because the user is not privileged enough, it wasn't possible to extract those passwords, but we will talk about it later on. However, this user was able actually to extract the passwords to the um, SSH um, service available on our, com on our company server. Yeah, from the WinSCP tool that we were talking about previously. Moreover, uh, there were some passwords saved in our um, Internet Explorer and Edge browsers. So uh, also these passwords were extracted. So the, they could be used um, for further attacks or this uh, inboxes, mailboxes could be used in social engineering um, by our uh, attacker. Okay, so what's the ne next thing the attacker would like to do? The next thing the attacker would like to do is to escalate the privileges of the user. Um, because when we escalate the privileges, and then we could get access to the files of other users, and extract information from the memory, dump, uh, uh, dump, um, dump process memory. And so, uh, some more interesting information could be gathered. And so let's try to uh, check what other, um, and in this case, uh, the attacker, um, let's say, was able to identify that our victim is using the GOG Galaxy, so this platform that is similar to Steam, that is that our child installed. And um, actually, um, this platform, uh, is running with the highest uh, possible privileges, uh, the system privileges. This is because uh, such uh, platforms like GOG, Steam, um, Epic Games, and so on, uh, must have high privileges to install games, to change the configuration of the, of the uh, games. So um, we could use the software to escalate um because it runs with high privileges and actually in this case one um uh, a member of uh, from our team uh, adrian uh, found a found a vulnerability in gog galaxy about uh, half a year ago and it was responsibly disclosed on our uh, secure academy blog where we can also find uh, some other results uh, of our research um Yes, yeah, so um, in this scenario, we will use the exploit uh, written by Adrian that allows us to gain system privileges um, with, with Dog Galaxy. Okay, so for that, uh, we need to um, download the uh, exploit to our victim's uh, machine from our attacker server uh, to the temporary directory. So we are downloading it. And after that, we will change the access permission to the uh, GOG Galaxy folder. Yes, so, so that, um, because this is a program files uh, directory to which normal users don't have uh, right access to. However, this exploit allows us to change the access permissions to the GOG Galaxy. And like that, um, we can replace, um, we can replace the uh, file, uh, the GOG Galaxy um, client uh, file, uh, client service file with our malicious um, reverse shell executable that will connect back to us with the highest privileges possible, so with the system privileges. Okay, so let's change this service file. So, so yeah, so we replace the file and after that, um, we can start the Galaxy service. Yeah, so this is, so we were able to, um, to change the uh, service um, file responsible for a Galaxy client. Yes, 
Yeah, so this there it is. Okay, and when we start this service, then we will it will run with local system privileges. So let's start it. And as you can see, we got another session. So let's go to the background and let's communicate with our new session. Okay, now let's check who are we. And as you can see, we have the system privileges um, on this particular machine. Uh, what could we do with the system privileges? Yeah, so this is the victim's machine. And what could we do with the system privileges? Uh, we could, um, to make it more convenient, we could start a PowerShell. And after that, uh, we can uh, download uh, Mimikatz to our temporary directory. So let's download it. It was downloaded. And after that, we can run Mimikatz to uh, dump credentials from the LSAS process. And uh, so we will run the debug privilege and we will extract uh, passwords and other credentials from uh, LSAS with the use of Mimikatz. So let's run it. And as you could see, we found um, NTLM hashes uh, and some other uh, credentials that are stored on our machine that could be used uh, to perform, um, for example, pass the hash attacks to attack other machines on our cor corporate network. Um, okay, so what's the next, next thing we can do with um, this kind of privileges? Uh, as we said, the ransomware is able to get access to other users' files. So uh, all the files in the system could be encrypted or made public. Um, also, um, in this case, we are able to get access to the remote ng configuration file of another user, of the admin user in this case. And so th th that was the tool responsible for uh, managing the connection with uh, RDP and service. Uh, okay, so let's uh, see what's in this configuration file. And as you can see, there is a username, there is some encoded password, there is a host name, and there is a port. Okay, so let's copy this um, hash and let's use um, another tool to, um, to uh, let's use another tool to um, decrypt this password. So let's copy it. And now let's paste this uh, string to our um, decrypting tool. And as you could see, we were able to capture another password uh, to our um, RDP server, but that's not all. Because let's use our lasagna uh, tool one more time which might be also interesting. So let's run it. And uh, it will take a while. And uh, so let me just, um, let me just, okay, make it a little smaller. Uh, so as you can see now, the lasagna tool was able to capture uh, password hashes and it was able to extract the information about the um, questions and answers uh, that are used in local user password reset, reset feature. Yeah, so, and this is also crucial. And what's more, in this case, we were able to gather the Wi-Fi passwords. So in this case, we could extract the Wi-Fi password to our corporate network. Um, Okay, so as you could see, um, this kind of um, this kind of uh, vulnerabilities or this uh, type of um, using the um, uh, using the um, uh, the, the home computer um, could provide uh, a lot of vulnerabilities that could be exploited um, by our um, attacker, so we have to take into con consideration that if the computer is used 
for personal purposes also, there is a higher risk that some vulnerable software or infected software was installed on this kind of um, workstation. Okay, and uh, so back to you, Mike. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, thank you, Artur, and I really enjoyed your presentation there. So uh, what uh, I'm going to talk about is using the VPN and uh, how the home computer can be a threat for the internal uh, systems. And especially when we are using some um, maybe not corporate device, but uh, we will just create a new uh, VPN connection on our you know, computer. So and someone will start using it uh, for work. Uh, still, this the device might be already infected or maybe there is another device that was already pre pre previously infected and this is uh, maybe your child computer or something like that then you can uh, expect someone to be able to connect from our um, uh, computer that's connected to the VPN to get to the inside of the network and scan it or perform some other uh, attacks. So let me show you the my desktop and um, let's go with uh, the presentation of the attack. Uh, so let me just present the, the scene of the environment that I'm going to use. So first of all, I have my domain controller, of course, on which there is uh, one service running at this moment. Of course, do not do it in the domain controller environment on the domain controller, but uh, use separate server. This is only for demo purpose. So I have here uh, two interface uh, in the network interface adapter, and one is the uh, corporate network. This is 10, 10, 10, 0. 255, sorry, 24 weights of the uh, mask, and uh, also the Ethernet one, which is uh, simulating the internet. Of course, this is my private uh, IP pool, and uh, this is only for the demonstration, but normally this would be the internet access. Uh, inside, I have the server. On the server, you will see soon enough that there is a web uh, server available and is presenting some resources to us. Uh, right now, I'm on the client computer. This client computer, if we look into uh, IP config, then we will see that this is the uh, network connected only to the uh, something that is simulating our internet connection. This is not a local to our corporate network. There is nothing about 10, 10, 10. If I try to ping, for example, 10, 10, 10, 20, which is my server, I get a general failure of the transmission. This is because uh, my uh, VPN is uh, not yet established. If I connect to the work, Okay, very simply connected. I already have a saved password. You should not save passwords there in general, but uh, for this purpose, I just uh, saved it there to make it faster. If I do the ping right now, you see the responses are coming back. So my server is up and running. Let's try to see if something is there. HTTP, and this is my JBoss server. Quite a legacy application, but uh, from the perspective of our penetration testing, we see a lot of legacy servers running somewhere around in the network. So this might be a possible vector of attacks for this um, um, attack. So another thing is that I have my Kali Linux uh, configuration here. And if you look at this one, you do not see a, a net net network with the 10. Uh, so in general, it's not possible for me to do that. For example, ping 10, 10, 10, 20, nothing network unreachable. The same would be with the NMAP scan. It will show that there is no possibility to scan this device. Uh, why I'm using this IP address, attacker will not know it, but uh, there, is a, there are possibilities to do it, this scan, when I will compromise, of course, the Windows 10 machine. Uh, I'll to show you the vector of attack possible there. I will just uh, follow this with uh, a slightly different payload. As you can see, I'm using the Metasploit console. This is perfect for the demonstration purposes. But if uh, the attacker would try to use this one, an antivirus will just detect all of those payloads without any troubles. So uh, basically, it's only used for the demonstration box. I'm just loading the payload here and also setting up what is the IP address of my local uh, host and then continuing with the um, setting up the port on which I will be listening and then, of course, exploiting uh, the vulnerability or rather not vulnerability, but let's say something is already running on the uh, uh, my server, on my client and probably I will need to wait here for 10, maybe 15 seconds. Oh, perfect, it's something showing up because 
the system was already infected. The system is with the malware running on it, and the system is giving me the reverse shell. So it's giving me connection from Windows 10 to my command and control system. And this might be a part of the larger botnet. The largest botnet that uh, are known has like hundreds of thousands of the computers all over the world that are infected and no one knows that they are infected there and just waiting for the commands from external sources. So right now, if I type the sessions, I will see that there is a session number one. So I will just use the session number one and connect to this session to start interacting with. Let's go with the shell. This is very similar, so who am I? It's showing me that this is Mike on the remote server, but IP config will show me that this is the, uh, also the server which has a connectivity to this uh, network. So if I just use the ping 10, 10, 10, 20, it will show there is a perfect uh, working ping. Uh, one more thing which I will present right now, but I will discuss it a little bit later and explain how it's possible. So let me just go to the tools folder. And from the tools, if you, if you can see here, there's OVPN. So first PowerShell and going inside of this and running really that OVPN PS1. This is presenting me some passwords. As you can guess, probably this is the open VPN passwords, which are recovered from the saved password configuration uh, on the Windows 10. How it's done, I will explain that later on when it's uh, the time for working with the Windows 10. So getting out of the PowerShell, getting out to my metapreter here and uh, setting the session in the background. Um, so the session still exists, sessions. Let's see, it's still valid. So I still have connection between my Kali Linux and my Windows 10 machine. Okay, what can I do next? I can just simply add the route. So route, oh, maybe I will just uh, move it up to find the command that, because it's faster than typing. Then 10, 10, 10, zero, this is the network with 24 bits mask. And number one is not the interface, but this is the session that we have on the uh, metapreter running currently. Okay. That's almost everything that I need to use. The last part is that I use, need to use the second module. This time it will be auxiliary and this will be the proxy server. Mm -hmm. Just showing the options. And let's see, it's a server port 1080. On the server port 1080, uh, so this is my local port, it will be listening a proxy. So next, what I need to do is just run. It's running the proxy. Last part is Vim and going into the etc and proxy chains to verify that there is already a configuration for my local host and the proxy on the 1080. So if I execute some commands with the proxy chains, like for example this ping, oh sorry not ping, but uh, nmap, then it will start scanning all those ports through my proxy chains. As you can see, there is a port 8080, but also other ports available like 3389. And uh, this is, of course, the uh, scanning, which is taking a lot of time. So normally you will need to wait for it quite a long to get some results. OK, so let me stop this one. Uh, maybe I will use proxy chains, but this time with the Firefox to verify that I can just simply go and use the compromised system that has the VPN to get inside of your network. And let's go with HTTP, HTTP, JBoss, uh, sorry, not JBoss, it's 10, 10, 10, 80, 80, and getting to my JBoss server really through the IP address that I even don't see on the networks inside of my uh, location. This is using the proxy chains through the Windows 10 machine and getting into the corporate network. What else? If you have a system that is infected, of course, remember that's quite natural, I think, is to have some ransomware and get to, for example, the SLB. And this will take some time, but at the moment, it will show the shells that are available inside of the system. At the same moment, I will show you that there is an open VPN. So in a, oh, this is the perfect share. And of course, remember that this share will be available with the credentials of the user, of course. And if the user will get on this infected machine, the ransomware, it will also attack the file systems that are there, available through the VPN. So let's go with uh, the open VPN. If I choose any connection, for example, new, VP, new VPN, uh, then it will start connecting. 
because I'm using bad practices of saving the passwords. Okay, maybe the passwords are stored in a correct way or for uh, like protected in some way. So disconnect. And let me see it. Uh, first of all, the, the passwords might be stored inside of the um, um, registry or in some files. In this case, in case of the open VPN, the passwords are stored on the registry. So let's see how they look like. So this is the HKCU, so current user software, open VPN, configs, and new VPN. One of the information is there's authentication data. If I open the authentication data, I will see this very not nicely looking string. Of course, those are the hexes, and on the right side, you have the uh, interpretation industry. But if you have been doing so much work as we do, and as Paul already mentioned, that we are only team that we know that completely reverse engineered data protection API, this is what you see and already understand. This is data protection API blob. So what can we do with it? First of all, of course, we can just simply export it to some uh, blob file in the tools. And let's do that. OK, see, there is a folder here. And in the, fold, in the in folder, there is this blob to data. What can I do? We have plenty of tools which we are sh uh, um, sharing with you after this presentation. And one of those is the uh, CQ Data API Blob Searcher, one of my favorite one, which is giving me possibility to search for the data protection API blobs. So I'm looking in the uh, in directory and um, getting the output into the out directory. So the password is really, or the VPN is really protected with the advanced encryption standard 256 SHA-512. So this is the possibility to really nicely encrypt the password. But how, what is where is the key for this? The key is this master key GUID. This master key GUID is really the information about the file. So when we go to the up data, okay, Microsoft, because of course Microsoft is protecting it, protecting so protect. This is the seed of my user. This is the default user, so it's this one. And here I have the I the same identifier as this one. Okay, so that's the file in which I'm looking for um, the key. This key, of course, is encrypted and it's encrypted with the password of the user really from the key that is derived from the password of the user so if you don't know the password of the user it will be hard to de de decrypt this one if you are in the domain joint environment you will find out that there is another file in this one that's starting with bk so bravo kilo and then the name of your domain this is a second copy of this key that is used for the decrypting uh, decryption used by the certificate on the active directory so let me go and uh, show you the script that I was using to decrypt the passwords. It's, well, I'll run the script, so let's see how it's working again. So I'm getting this information, and this is the, the username and passwords from the system. I'm not typing anywhere here the passwords. This is because I'm just using this function unprotect from system security cryptographic protect data. Protect data means data protection API. And unprotect is using three parameters. That's very simple. Encrypted blob, there is an entropy. Entropy is like a second password. It's distinguishing between the applications. So one application cannot decrypt the password by another application. But look at here. It's just an entropy sitting up here. OK, uh, funny fact. It's uh, Here it's the 17 bytes, but the entropy must be 16. And the last byte is 0, 0. This is the end of the string, uh, the null character. So this is why I'm truncating this uh, to the 15, uh, from 0 to 15. So it's 16 bytes of entropy. And then just the scope. Scope is the distinguishing between the current user and the system. Of course, to do this for the system, I need to have higher privileges than user. But any user and any malware that is running in your uh, context in your security context, we'll be able to just simply politely ask the uh, system, hey, give me the password in unencrypted form. So this is what I used there. Okay, so this is one of the aspects here, how the attacker or even maybe your spouse or maybe your uh, children that are just interested in some hacking can try to get inside the organization. But there is even easier way if you are looking for something that is 
extremely easy. And this is not that it's the correct way. This is, of course, for script kiddies or whoever is trying to use it. But maybe someone is going to just play around on your network and see, OK, I'm bored. I'm sitting at home, finally working from a home, not from office. And maybe I'm bored and I will just see how good my IT security is doing. And there is lots of scripts, uh, et cetera, that can be used. But I will show you one of the two. And this is showing how easy sometimes it is to compromise unpatched or a little bit like more legacy systems. So I'm using Armitage. That is a, a tool that I can just simply go and say that scans. And let's go with, for example, the quick scan OS detect. Let's type in the IP of the network, 24, boom. It's starting for me the quite complicated syntax for uh, getting the Nmap. This is, of course, the version of the DB Nmap, so it's already building a database of uh, the attacks. Some of the penetration testing like to use this one on smaller attacks, uh, on smaller uh, networks, because it's making a map of the uh, computers, also the enumerating all the payloads and external tools that you can use for the attacks. Sometimes it's uh, a little bit slower because it's a Java-based application, so uh, no, I'm not a fan of those. Uh, but in general, it will present us uh, very soon in the uh, list of the uh, machines already with uh, detected uh, operating systems. And oh, you see, it's uh, getting the output, OK, and it's suggesting, hey, why not to use this many attacks find attacks? <laughs> OK, why not to use it? Okay, So attacks find attacks. And Okay, oh, there's something very short was going on here. I hope uh, it's uh, going to show it a little bit better. Uh, so already see, oh, maybe it was so fast. So getting the attack and then there is a list of uh, possible attacks that was detected by uh, those uh, for the system. Of course, if I choose another system, there will be a little bit different list of the attacks. For example, there is some MSSQL attack here, and I can just choose from the menu here how to attack. Sometimes, uh, and for example, for this presentation, I will show you one of the attacks that was quite popular some time ago. And, uh, thank you, NSA, for using this <laughs> and showing everyone that there is Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue is an uh, attack for the um, SMB, and let me show how easy it is. I'm just choosing the list, selecting on the right side, of course, where I'm attacking, choosing it from the list, clicking on it, and clicking plunge. OK, fire and forget. Now I can rest, uh, relax, drink, uh, get a sip of my drink, and then, of course, waiting for the results of uh, getting there. Uh, why I'm showing SMB-related uh, attack? Because really, it's uh, um, the problem of uh, the, even the SMB version 3 that was uh, patched recently by Microsoft, that still there are uh, lots of the possible attacks on this kind of protocols, even in the newest version. Right now, there is no exploit uh, publicly available for the newest uh, type of the attack on SMP3, but still, maybe you have some unpatched systems. And let's just simply um, uh, show you that this is the compromised system. As you can see, the beautiful icon is changing even for this. And we can uh, start interacting uh, with uh, this device and saying, for example, who am I? OK. This should show me that I'm system. So let's echo hello into the C test.txt. So probably something will be on this Windows 7 machine. Of course, this is Windows 7. It's untouched for the eternal blue, but this is quite old attack, as you know. This is uh, 2017. If you have something that is still vulnerable to this kind of attack, oh, better patch it or remove it from the network. I see. So in general, I do not say that the uh, using VPN is a bad thing. But just if you do this very fast, because right now everyone needs to start focusing on the new type of the um, uh, remote working, it might be posing some additional threats. And uh, you need to focus a little bit more on uh, limiting the access from external users, or maybe doing something like a conditional access uh, or uh, working with the users, giving them a little bit more perspective on how they need to behave and how they need to uh, protect uh, the corporate resources. OK, Ma uh, Miłosz, back to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's get back to using untrusted networks, home networks, maybe public networks. Um, we all know that 
they are unsafe, right? But what exactly can happen? Um, especially now uh, when when there's a public working from home um, using some unmanaged networks and people are staying at home, we are seeing more and more phishing attacks because it's great opportunity for the attackers. So if I'm connected to public network or some home network, which is unmanaged, maybe compromised, what's the risk? Um, one of the possibilities is that someone controlling the router of public or home network uh, is also controlling the HCP server. So if I am controlling the HCP server, I am controlling what configuration you are getting while you are connecting to my network. Um, okay, and what can I do with it? So my idea first uh, from many is to serve you a DNS server. And in this case, it is my DNS server. I am controlling it. I am controlling the router. Uh, I have set up DNS server and I want you to use it. And what can happen? Each time you are browsing the internet, you are browsing some web page. I imagine you are not typing some IP address because no one knows it. it it's obvious. We are using domain names. So for example, as you can see here, it's seekeracademy.com. And DNS is responsible for resolving it to some IP address. And it usually works. In ordinary way, we would get correct IP address, we would get to correct web page. But in case of public Wi-Fi, and if someone would um, just give us their DNS, which is compromised, it might be used to um, make us go to some malicious web page, some prepared web page, some fake login panel, and we might even not notice that. And in a minute, we will we will see that attack. By the way, DNS is a great thing from security perspective. We are using it a lot. We have a great video about it. Um, you can even use it to transfer files. And it's sometimes really neglected, monitoring DNS and, and taking care about it. But it's a huge possibility for attackers. So um, let's see what can happen in case of public network. Let me just share my screen. I have to cho choose which one. It's quite hard in my extensive home office. It's quite big. OK, so here we are. We have prepared for you today um, two web pages. And let's see what they are. We have demosecureacademy.com um, slash admin. It's some demo login panel. In this case, it's WordPress. OK, and let's see how it works. We can log in here. And a happy guy is um, waving at us. OK, it works. It's correct web page. Secureacademy.com is a domain we, we own. It's our legitimate web page. But we have also bought something similar. And we have created demo.secureacademy.com. Oh, let's see what it is. OK. It looks similar, except for that N. It is quite hard to see. And if we would log in here, the same thing happens. Because in a real life situation, it would be a domain bought by the attacker. The login panel would be spoofed. If someone would um, devote a few hours of work, it's quite simple. Uh, he or she can make it looking very, very similar. But let's see what happened here. Uh, if we would go to log.txt, we can see that password was uh, saved here. So this is, in fact, fake login panel that someone have created to um, steal our password. And OK, right now I have uh, willingly uh, write wrong address here. OK, but what will happen if I will switch to public network? Let's close it, um, flush our DNS to be sure that everything is fine and not cached. OK, flush DNS, perfect. So right now we have. Um, normal uh, computer and we are switching from my NAT network to demo public Wi-Fi. This is my uh, router, this, there's a DNS there and let's apply it. Okay, so we have switched the network and right now let's try it again. Going to legitimate web page, demo.secureacademy.com. Oh, forgotten, slash admin. Okay, this is our login panel. Everything seems fine. CQ demo two. 
let's see what hour it is, 8.21, okay, we're logging in, everything seems fine, but if we would go to log.txt, we can see that our password was again stolen, and that thing does not happen on the Secure Academicon. And what's the reason? Let's switch to the machine which is not yet connected to public Wi-Fi. If I would try to resolve the address of Secure academy.com, you can see that it's 52.57 something something, okay. And let's try the same for malicious page. It's 18.194 something, okay. And now we are getting to this machine. What happened here? If we would do the same, let me just, okay, we can see IP addresses and we are trying to resolve the hosts here. Um, First one, correct, Secure Academy. Okay, we can see it's 18, so the wrong one. It's the same as this. So probably already know what happened. Um, we are connected to some public or compromised network. Someone has uh, the control over DNS and we are fooled by DNS. Um, and what's the mitigation? Oh, well, it's quite simple. If if someone would be um, careful enough and typing HTTPS each time, um, yeah, I agree, you would get a warning. But uh, if we are talking about some users, a lot of users, we cannot be responsible and we cannot uh, assume that they are all using um, modern browsers, especially on home devices, and that they are carefully typing domains. So this could be a quite convenient way for the attacker to spoof something and to just serve us something bad that will um, look exactly like the same, like some legitimate thing, and in fact, uh, in the background, steal our things. So what's the mitigation? One of the options is the thing we are um, talking about a lot today, it's a VPN. So this machine is, is more secure in my environment, so let's try the same action with that one. We are right now connected to, to the NAT network, so it's not compromised, as you can see here, and we are switching to demo public Wi-Fi, just as previously. Okay, apply. And what happens here? Previously, I have configured a VPN client to automatically ask me to connect each time I, I'm changing the network, so, okay, let's follow it. Um, we are connecting VPN. Okay, I, I know Mike, so I'm not saving the passwords, never. You can even set it in the config to prevent users doing that. Um, so never save passwords. Um, okay, and let's see. Let's give it a second, it should connect. Okay, we are connected to VPN. And let's try the same thing. We can begin with resolution again. Secure Academy, we have 18 and correct one. We have 52, and we would go, we, if we would go to the web browser, we can try to go to legitimate web page and log in here. And everything is okay, and if I would type a log.txt here, it should not exist because we are on the correct page. So no such thing as previously happened here because I have a VPN connection, which is configured in order to prevent me from using um, different DNS than this one advised by VPN. So when we are talking about VPN, there are a few important things. First of all, um, from the security perspective, make sure that your VPN is uh, enforcing whole traffic, whole client generated traffic to go through the tunnel. So. Uh, if we would like to secure uh, users using public network or home networks, we want that. We definitely want all traffic to go through the tunnel. If you are, for example, administering some big network and you are interested only in giving the people possibility to access some resources and without caring about the security that much, you can do split tunneling, but we do not recommend that. Um, the other thing is to advise and to make the peers using your DNS because as you can see, DNS can be used in many malicious ways. So you want to use your corporate managed DNS servers. And the last thing from, from the demo, the last, um, the last advice is if you have the opportunity, um, make sure that your clients, your, uh, your users are forced to use VPN and they know how it works and they are um, 
they are taught, they are aware that it's important and uh, yeah, they want to be connected because they want to be safe. Okay, so that's it for, for the DNS. Let's go back to the slides. Um, yeah. Okay, we are back here. Um, so the next thing that can happen when we are using, when we are working from home. Um, the thing is that people from home office, from, from some remote uh, locations, they have a lot of time because no one is controlling them. Um, no one is looking. So we might have uh, quite a lot of stupid ideas, maybe some tricky ones. Personally, I have a lot. Uh, if I'm staying at home, I have really dumb ideas. So what about DLP? Let's imagine that I'm sitting here working from home and I want to steal some data. Okay, and how to do it? Um, there's a lot of possibilities. And what can you do to prevent me from doing that? You can implement some, some DLP uh, systems, some um, filters, some rules on your mail server to prevent me from stealing something. But important thing for you is to, um, to realize that these systems are great. They are working great, um, but their purpose is not to ensure that nothing will ever um, go out from your company. So let's go straight to the example. Um, earlier today, just to avoid waiting a few minutes for the response, I have sent some, I have tried to send some personal data. We can see the file. This is actually um, something I got from Arthur today. Uh, Arthur possess uh, a lot of funny websites and this one was something fake people. Uh, so this is a, a set of fake data, uh, which is designed in, in order to, um, be detected as public information. We have names here, we have some country codes, um, zip codes, telephone numbers, uh, IDs, etc. So this is some personal data we would like to get it. For example, it, it's a list of our clients. Okay, and I have tried to send it outside the organization. Here, Mr. Alan, our uh, funny guy, is from CQDemo Pro. It's our test domain. And I have just tried to send it to uh, my real email. Why not? And what was the effect? I got the message from Microsoft Outlook. Uh, I like that guy, that my message was blocked. Okay, um, message is attached. Okay, I see the reason, message containing sensitive information, uh, some some uh, social security number, tax ID, etc. And this is great. This is the purpose of DLP, to detect it, to look into the files, to uh, inspect your messages and to block uh, something which is flagged and to trigger alert to send you a reply, that's okay. And uh, it's good if someone is not smart enough, like me, and it's good if someone just make a mistake. We all have uh, some contacts in Outlook. Um, if we are sending thousands of messages a month, someone might make a mistake and actually not willingly send something outside. DLP is good. It will trigger our alert, we will uh, get the information, nothing will be sent out, okay. But if I am a malicious user, um, I can think sometime, and I can think that if DLP is inspecting my files, I can try to encrypt it, why not? Um, let's use 7-zip. Many companies have that installed. You can use, um, you can actually zip the file using building tools, doesn't matter. Let's use super secure password. Um, yeah, okay, I encrypt file name. That's perfect. Yeah, I can even uh, delete the extension. Maybe someone was smarter than me and set the rule to prevent sending um, 7-zip. That's possible. Um, yeah, and let's try, uh, try to send it now. We can try again to my email. Okay, test something and yeah let's just attach that file and wait a second so we are sending it it should be out here and i should receive it in a few seconds if everything is all right so what's my purpose here uh the purpose here is to um to remind you that no dlp system can uh can ensure you that you are 100 percent safe we always have to take it into account and we always have to assess the risk and accept DLP, which, which is good and definitely recommended to implement. Uh, the more tricky thing, but the crucial one from a security perspective is uh, 
airbag, role-based access control. If your users, if uh, let's imagine some John. So John and my company should have only permissions he needs to, um, to do his work. Nothing more. It's easy to um, just give everything everyone. Okay, everything works. No one is complaining that uh, he or she doesn't have access, but it's not the right way. The right way is to keep the least privileges and least access, so you will limit the possibilities of people stealing your data for some reason. So that's definitely something worth considering. But at the same time, we are seeing that companies are usually um, usually do not have Airbag properly implemented because that's quite a lot of work. So in the meantime, uh, I have received email. Right now you see it, it's from, from Alan to me, uh, and we have the personal data here. So DLP was bypassed. And okay, let's go one step further. Imagine you have perfect DLP system that, uh, I don't know, you are brute forcing my super secure password here, and you have some, or maybe uh, based on a file name here, you have assessed that this is personal data and you have detected. But anyway, if I have access, I can just open the file and do a, make a photo of it. If I'm at home, who will stop me? If, if we have to remember that if I have uh, the possibility to view the file, I can steal it. And that, that should be a um, very good assumption if we are talking about data protection. Uh, okay, let's get back to slides. Um, yep. And right now, back to Paula. Okay, great. Thank you so much uh, for, for this. Now it's time to uh, get back to uh, securing tips and tricks. So basically, we're going to discuss different types of scenarios where you're going to learn what kind of implementation steps to do in order to uh, secure um, from what you've seen. So uh, there are two, two approaches that we should take into consideration. First of all, it's quick mitigations. And for the quick mitigations, we see something that you are able to implement pretty much right now. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, a demonstration that is related with that. And later on, you're going to see the long-term mitigation that Miłosz, um again is going to present. And at the end of this webinar, you're going to get a bit of a summary with the quick mitigation steps, because not everything we're going to be showing today on the webinar, but only a couple of things, and also the long-term mitigation steps. So let's get quickly into this one. So first of all, you can deploy, for example, the operating system on the USB devices, so on a USB pen drive. But the problem of this is that not every user will be uh, used to that kind of working environment. So long story short, uh, you are able to implement, for example, something that we call Windows to go. But the problem of this, well, it, mm, let me call it, it's not a problem really, but the problem of this uh, is that that particular solution is not developed anymore. So it's there, it's getting security updates. You can still uh, set up the Windows 10 on it and you can um, distribute the pen drives with your um, set up um, accepted um, compliant um, Windows, Windows um, installation to the users. And users would be able to boot from these particular USB sticks and then they will have Windows um, operating system that is set up according to your needs. And that is in the case when users are actually using their home computers. So this is one of the options. Now that requires, of course, specific pen drives for this. So that could be um, a bit, um, uh, costly, but on the other hand, it's a quick mitigation that allows you to assure that users are connecting to your environment only from the preset um, operating system. Another option for um, the RDP problem that I was mentioning at the very beginning was to implement, um, simply speaking, a server that could be a gateway with the multi-factor authentication. So uh, MFA, of course, could be um, uh, helping here. But what I just want to show you, it's a simple solution that you were able to quickly set up for all of the users so that uh, users, they are logging on with their uh, credentials, there could be an MFA on the top of it. And while you sign in, you've got here a possibility 
to log on to, for example, user's workstation that is turned on in the office. So that could be potentially a solution. Now, if we do open this, um, it could be a, a regular connection or it could be also a business app. But if you open that particular link, uh, which is purely a remote desktop connection, and this is our uh, lab at secureacademy.com. So this is a solution that we are using in the real life. Then basically, um, when you get into a login option, let me show you this one. You can set up, of course, uh, over here the password. So let me log on and we are here specifying uh, the login. So it's going to be in here labs and I'm going to use, for example, SMK0 and I'm going to use some kind of a password that uh, we have generated uh, before. And eventually, uh, when we set up OK, we've got a connection. We could have a connection to our real desktop uh, that we are using every day while we are actually in the office. Yeah, so that connection takes a moment, but uh, we are already here. Here we go, and let me show you. And then eventually, it could be your desktop. Yes, in our case, we are using this as our remote lab. So whenever, for example, our team travels or we deliver trainings, this is pretty much the solution we are using. But that is a, a solution that you can quickly set up even within a one day uh, if you've got a plan for this in order to make sure that users are, are actually connecting through some kind of a gateway. So um, this is the quick mitigation. Of course, there is a bunch of more quick mitigations we can implement. We're going to discuss them uh, in the summary, but uh, let's back uh, get back into the long term mitigations. So to show you one of the one of the solutions here where you will be able to see basically what else you can do in order to make sure um, we are on a safe side. So this time, Miwosh, once again, back to you. Let's have a look what could be a long term mitigation and then let's get back to the summary. Um, okay, I'm just getting back to the slides for a second. Um, yeah. Um, okay, conditional access. That is that is the thing we are right now interested about because if we are talking about working from home or working from working from some uh, remote location, there are basically two things we have to worry about. Um, how are the users connecting to our network? So in this case, the answer and the security measure, good thing to do is VPN and enforcing it. But also it is a tricky part, um, what is connecting? So what device, what operating system, if it's safe or not? Um, and if you are that lucky and if you have a, a lot of laptops, everything configured, um, set up, and you are getting into the crisis like we have nowadays and your users can take PCs, corporate managed PCs uh, to their homes and work from, from their homes with corporate managed devices, that's great. But sometimes um, you might uh, be in a little trouble because um, PCs might, be, uh, might not be notebooks. So um, if, if you would assess the risk, you might think, okay, um, letting them using private devices, it's maybe not the best idea from the security perspective, but on the other hand, um, my users have to work in order for the company to survive. So um, some companies might allow users to work with their uh, private devices, especially if you are a cloud-owned company or um, a lot of things is in cloud and people can work with their private devices, with their mobile phones, why not? Okay, so let's let's see how to how to manage it and how to make it safe. So the thing, as, as I mentioned, is conditional access. So um, what basically what, what it basically is, um, if someone is trying to access my infrastructure, cloud or on-premise, some applications, doesn't matter, Outlook, uh, OneDrive, etc., um, they have to authenticate. They have to use their login password and uh, prove they are themselves. Okay, so I know that someone is someone, but I would like to set some rules. I would like to grant the access on some conditions. I would like uh, my users to have MFA configured, and I would like to do some checks on their devices. Even if I'm allowing to use private devices, I would like to check something. And if they will fulfill my policy, my requirements, I would grant that access. If not, I wouldn't. And as you can see here, we can base um, 
conditional access, for example, of the of some device properties, um, we can define different policies per different applications. Um, we are we are talking here about Microsoft Intune. So th these are the um, capabilities of Microsoft Intune. I will show it to you in a second. Um, we can also uh, base our conditions on the location. So uh, if we are operating, for example, uh, only from, I don't know, Germany, and we know that no one is traveling, we can allow only uh, IP addresses from Germany, or we can limit IP addresses, whatever. Um, we can also... Um, attack uh, the session user risk, but we will not get into that because right now the purpose is to show the conditional access and therefore I am going to share my screen. So um, again, uh, right now I know which one. Okay, and we can see uh, portal Azure.com here. So we are going to Intune and some of you might think, okay, why Intune? This is MDM solution, mobile device management. So it's about probably mobile phones, some tablets, some small mobile devices, definitely not Windows, but Intune is also about Windows and this is this is great. So this is MDM from Microsoft, which allows us to manage Android devices, iOS devices, but also Windows computers. Um, so this is generally a great tool. If you would like to uh, go through each window here, through each configuration option, for, uh, through everything we can set up here, uh, it would take like, I, I don't know, a week or something and to to uh, discuss the enrollment possibilities, etc. But we are not focusing about that. We have some crisis. So um, I would like to get some information about the device. I would like to create a policy, for example, only newest Windows 10 and with uh, antivirus and real-time protection turned on. Okay. Uh, and actually with Intune, I can do it. Uh, I can do it without managing someone's devices. People would be quite angry if I would um, configure everything on their private devices. I just want to know, to check something, and uh, I have uh, I have this this feeling that my policy is good. I would like to grant access on this condition. Okay, so let's see how it's done, because actually it's configured here. So we're going to device compliance, and as you can see, I have previously defined Windows 10 BYOD policy. So this is the policy, and in my case, for Windows 10 computers, I'm allowing only Windows 10. I don't like 7, all right? Only 10 is good, in my opinion, here. So uh, we have Windows 10 BYOD, okay. And let's see how it looks quickly. Oh, something interesting happened here. Let's maybe refresh it, because I do not see half of the page. Um, Okay, it's also interesting how does it uh, work in different browsers. And in, in Firefox, for example, when I was trying to set it, some buttons were not working, and Edge is definitely better for this. But as you can see, some sometimes something is quite interesting. So okay, we have a policy here. We have one compliant device and one non-compliant. Um, yeah, and let's see what is set here quickly for you to understand. We have two PCs prepared for today. Um, I have them here, so we have Intune 1, we have Intune 2, and we will switch to them in a second, but let's let's uh, quickly inspect this policy. We have one computer which is compliant, it is okay, and we have the second one which is not compliant, something is wrong. And actually here you can, uh, you have plenty of options here, but you can also see what is not compliant. Um, so if we would go here to device compliance, we would be able to see my rules and we would be able to see which of them is fulfilled. So in case of this computer, uh, we have anti-spyware turned on, okay, password complexity is uh, compliant, but antivirus and real-time protection is not. So everything is okay except that things. And what does it mean? If, we're, uh, if we would look only to Intune, um, I can set the policy which says something like this. Um, this group of users, in my case, Windows 10 BYOD, um, their devices must fulfill these recommendations. If they are not all um, matched, if they are not compliant, even one, I am flagging device as not compliant. And that's it for Intune. This is capability of Intune. If in Intune you can configure devices, you can define policies and mark device as compliant or not. If you are managing corporate devices, this gives you a great visibility of, of your settings and your compliance, but here, uh, in my case, uh, if I would like to grant conditional access, Intune itself is not a complete solution. So let's get back to the first panel. And the uh, second thing, uh, which is not Intune itself, it's a part of Azure Active Directory, 
premium is conditional access. And okay, it's loaded. And here you can see some default policies, but I have created my own. I have created new policy and let's quickly see what it does. Um, we have here specified that some users, uh, in my case, is a group of users for all apps. This is interesting. Uh, if you are, if you will be ever configuring this policy, please make sure to make uh, appropriate exclusions because uh, in this case, if you would not exclude Microsoft Intune, private devices uh, would not be able to register themselves in Intune and therefore the status could not be checked. So uh, and, and at the same time, you would be demanding some settings to be uh, compliant, but you will not be able to check them because device is not compliant and Intune cannot work. So this is good exclusion and good thing to remember. And okay, I haven't specified any, spec uh, any specific conditions. We have two controls set. As you can see here, I am demanding MFA and Intune compliance. I, I just want my users to have MFA because it raises security greatly. And I want their devices to be compliant and my policies are not very strict. I, the only thing I want from them is to have um, updated Windows 10 device, some complex password um, and antivirus turned on. I do not even demand Windows Defender anything which is approved by Microsoft would be okay for me. So quite basic things. If we are thinking about private devices, for example, I personally, I would not uh, demand from my users a BitLocker encryption because um, in most cases, people would not have um, Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise or Education Edition. So that's enough for me. Um, yeah, and additionally, I have said here that users would uh, have to authenticate every two hours. So that's the policy and see if it actually works. If we would get back to our machines, uh, you already seen that on Intune 01 machine, uh, Outlook is working fine. We have, uh, we can access corporate resources. Some, some passwords is here too. Okay, we can try that. And it should work because this device, as you have seen scenario, is compliant with my policy. So this is actually working. We can log into applications. Um, we can go to to Teams. We can uh, use browser to lo log into portal.office.com. Um, and it's okay, it's working. But if we would switch to device number two, which is not compliant, things are not that well. Let's try to open Outlook. Maybe in the meantime, uh, web access. And let's see how is this working here. Oops, okay, I can get to this. Why? Because my device is not compliant. And the great thing, another great thing about uh, this is that user can actually go to device management portal. You can avoid some calls from the help desk to, to help us because uh, they can do they can go here and you have excluded Microsoft Intune from that policy. Even from a uh, not compliant device, I can go here as a user and only here because this is the only exclusion and see why my device is flagged not compliant. So if I'm working from home, I have the possibility to fix it on my own. I can see that uh, this is about Windows Defender Ultimate Malware, uh, about antivirus. I can see some, um, some tips here and I can actually go here, um, enable it, check status and it should be okay. It should work. So yeah, let's, let's try Outlook, but it's also not working. So I can assure you. Um, so that, that's, that's the thing, that's conditional access. And um, this is uh, something, maybe it's, maybe it's long-term mitigation. Yeah, I agree with that. But conditional access itself can be implemented quite quickly uh, in case of a situation like uh, what we have now. And it can really, really enhance your security. So um, with that quick few steps, you can make sure that um, devices are at least not that bad. For example, if we have this little fellow here, Windows 7, favorite systems of many, it also would not work. It's not even a Windows 10. I have defined policy only for Windows 10 and nothing else would be allowed. If we would try to connect here um, with B CQDemo Pro, it will definitely not work. It's not uh, compliant with my policy. 
And in Windows 10, uh, it's actually, okay, MFI, that's good. It's on my phone. Um, in Windows 10, it is quite great because in, in Windows 7, you, you just get, you can get there from here. Okay, bye. Uh, and you are in trouble because in case of Windows 7, despite the fact that it's not supported and shouldn't be used anymore, uh, enrollment of Intune was not that easy. But if we are in Windows 10, you can configure enrollment uh, to be automatic. So user, users only have to um, do something which is called workplace join. So this device is not joined into the Active Di Azure Active Directory. It's only registered. The difference is that if we are joined, I would be able to log into Windows with this account. If I am only registered, this device is registered. MDM is checking its status in my in my case, but it's not managed and corporate accounts cannot uh, sign into that uh, Windows machine. And uh, in, uh, in any time, users can just uh, remove that and it can be normal, ordinary, private device. So that's good. And um, Self-enrollment in Windows 10 is uh, so simple that users can do it themselves. So it's quite a convenient solution for, um, for making sure what devices are connecting. Um, okay, let's quickly go back to the slides and see one other thing uh, for Intune. Um, okay, so in my case, I had cloud-only deployment. Our CQDemo Pro is uh, Office 365 tenant, but also uh, Intune can be configured. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's possible to configure it to protect together with conditional access on-premise um, infrastructure. So you can apply conditional access policy to control and to um, secure everything. So that's quite great. Um, Intune is... Uh, fine solution, so definitely recommend to uh, take a quick look at it. There are also other MDMs, but if we are talking about quickly setting up conditional access uh, for Windows 10 devices, and it's it, one of the easiest. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, worth trying. Okay, so for the summary, we are getting back to Paula again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Miłosz, for the great part of the presentation. So, uh, yeah, it's time for summary. Uh, we won't take uh, much of your time, uh, just a little bit to get into the points that, uh, in our opinion, should be taken into consideration while implementing a secure uh, remote access. So, um, to do a quick mitigations on the user side. So that might sound quite easy, but on the other hand, we could not miss that particular part. So eventually, um, things like when you are working from the cafe and so on, do not leave your device unattended. Make sure that you know where it is and so on, because uh, it's easy uh, to get that kind of thing stolen. And um, when we've got a personal device, as we already mentioned, that security might be a little bit lowered on those. Uh, on the other hand, while you are connecting to public Wi-Fi, Miwosh was also showing you demonstration uh, where you were able to play with that kind of a traffic, uh, with, the, with the wireless traffic. So eventually remember uh, that you've got a VPN through which you can connect to, and that could be a way uh, to mitigate it. On the other hand, uh, whenever we are playing with software on the machines, Arthur was showing you the situation where there was a user's computer, with the software that uh, unfortunately was vulnerable. And on the other hand, everybody else that is able to access your device could be potentially a threat uh, to uh, corporate information. Now, more interesting part, I believe for most of us, which is a quick mitigations on the enterprise side. These ones involve things like implementing operating system on a pen drive, which we already mentioned, which is Windows to go. But there is also a possibility to enable multi-factor authentication on different types of services. For example, in Office 365, you've got a possibility to do it so that as and when we was logging on, that was pretty much the case. You are able to put uh, the, or get the SMS and from uh, your mobile phone, you are able to introduce it to log on uh, together with your password, or you can also have authenticator app. So different types of factors that you are using to authenticate simply uh, as simple as this. 
Now, things like MFA for a VPN, very important thing, because uh, you could see also within our demonstrations that we are able to extract password from the memory of the operating system, not necessarily for Windows logon, but for things that are stored in the credential manager. So anything that could actually um, be used in order to connect to enterprise services. But Things like updates, simple thing, um, whenever there is some kind of a vulnerability with the vendor of the VPN solution you are using, we need to make sure actively this time, particularly important thing uh, that this particular solution is up to date, but also communication with users that since we are performing remote work, that kind of threats might increase. So that's why we have to be tuned in order to make sure that we are not falling for different types of phishing attempts. On the other hand, um, whenever we are thinking about IT security personnel, these guys need to be prepared to answer questions, that's for sure, but also to review logs that are released with the remote access. So quite a, a I would say common thing, but on the other hand, that's the thing that we are, or in some companies that we know people are not focusing on. This time we need to know where to look at in order to make sure that we're able to detect uh, a malicious logon and so on. And eventually we need to know what to do in such case. Um, so it depends, of course, on the situation. And on the other hand, we need to be in general uh, prepared for a little bit larger bandwidth uh, because uh, that's what we are all experiencing um, also while, for example, delivering this webinar. On the other hand, when we are thinking about long-term mitigations, there is much, much more to do. Things like implementations of different types of solutions as Miwash was showing you to manage different types of devices, as well mobile devices, as well uh, user computers that are their personal computers connecting to the corporate network and so on. The possibility to isolate the machines, for example, while using VPN from each other so that they are able only to connect to dedicated services. Or you can use the solution that I was showing to have the remote access in order to use maybe not even the connection to your um, regular corporate computer that is out there in the office, but it could be as well just a link in order to make sure that you are able to open your business app. So if that's possible, of course, because not every app can be done this way, but most of them, they can. So that's why um, we presented that solution and it's quick to implement too. On the other hand, from the VPN perspective, we need to make sure, of course, that it's highly available um, and redundant. So this is a clear, clear case, but uh, this is the moment where it's not just a VPN somewhere out there um, working and presenting as the possibility to connect to the remote infrastructure, but also um, the uh, highly available VPN because this is where pretty much people will be uh, connecting through. And also uh, different types of um, situations that are clientless related. Maybe um, VDI could be an option over here, who knows? But this is the long-term mitigation, yes? So that eventually you've got um, the computer or certain connection that you make somewhere, you access the infrastructure through the portal, and uh, this is the place where you are able to uh, do your job. So these are the different types of mitigations that are worth uh, having a look at. Now, eventually, while we are looking at um, our planning, um, so, the goal is very simple for this. So we need to make sure that your employees at the end are able to, to do their job and they want to do their job correctly. So without the right tools, without clear expectations, without the guidance, um, they'll be pretty much left playing a, a kind of a guessing game, uh, how they should proceed. So what will be their way to share data with each other? What will be their way to cooperate? So we need to think right now actively, what can we do to make sure that we are setting our employees for uh, work um, remotely? And eventually this is our new practice and we kind of all know that. So we want to set up some standards. We want to set up some expectations and we, we need to have some procedures um, in place for all of our employees. So there's a couple of questions eventually that we will need to ask and uh, what that could be. So uh, one of those could be, will they be working from their personal computers and devices or their corporate ones? Um, so this is what we try to answer within this webinar. Do they have access to 
uh, different types of third party software? If yes, then how is this a portal of a third party software that you just need a username and a password and that's it? Or do they have to access that software through your local network and so on? So um, would that be a VPN? Would that be a remote desktop? Uh, would that be a gateway that so, so the remote desktop uh, server through which they're going to be connecting to their app. So there are different options um, for work. And what are, in general, the conditions that are optimal? Yeah. So we don't want to create something difficult. We want to make sure that they're going to be connecting securely uh, to their business app. So once you have accounted in general for that kind of like questions, we need to make sure that uh, that kind of like whatever we like information we gather um, works for us as a good resource that will create some expectations that will provide a framework uh, to make sure that um, eventually we are providing an efficient working a remote environment. And at the end, uh, some of the things might be quite difficult to achieve within the short time frames. But on the other hand, um, we, we see that it's not really worth the effort. It is an effort that we have to make to make sure that our critical functions within the companies are maintained and that they're working securely. So um, what we just trying to say is that eventually this is not a very easy time for us right now. And um, looking at the present threat, it looks like the, the COVID-19 it's more imminent uh, than the more abstract threat of breaks in cyber. But eventually, uh, for the uh, remote work uh, to effectively manage it, to be to be productive in that time, um, different types of companies they need to have a good approach to this particular situation, and um, we have to have a level a level um, a hat uh, and. A Plan. So this is basically uh, the approach that we are presenting here. So regarding different types of resources, some of you guys were asking for links. So that's something that we're going to be sharing in the summary blog post on our blog. But for now, um, regardless of the time zone, please have a look at a couple of a couple of things here. First of all, NIST perspective. So this is this alert message that I was uh, mentioning at the very beginning. So please have a look at this. Um, it's very interesting from CERT. And um, if it's about interesting article um, that is nice to read uh, for the afternoon, uh, then basically um, what is nice to uh, look at, it's the fourth summary about the future of the um, of the VPNs. Uh, so uh, this is this is um, something that it's a nice reading for the afternoon, um, looking at what kind of different problems do we have. So if you guys have questions, um, then please, of course, don't hesitate them to put them on our blog. So this is the the blog address where we will need to um, eventually post some questions, and this is the place where you will be able to uh, get the different types of tools as well and the presentation and so on. So do not hesitate to get there. We've got over there lots of different types of videos as well that are free um, and that uh, we share with you to improve that level of uh, cybersecurity and knowledge. So a little bit of a um, uh, good good insight into cybersecurity from, from our side. And uh, at the end, um, there's a couple of things also to say. So um, we've got as well um, the tools. So this is along uh, the, the link to tools. There is a username though and password. So make sure that you're going to take a picture or something if you want to do it right now, because um, this is pretty much how you have to uh, log on. And eventually, uh, hopefully you had, uh, you have uh, even like more interesting questions uh, as the cybersecurity field is very complex. So uh, make sure that you're gonna get these particular tools and uh, you're gonna enjoy all the all the materials. So um, next part, of course, from our site, which we uh, love to share, uh, to be absolutely sincere with you, this, we are very proud of it. So we will definitely do not miss it. And um, if you want to level up with your Windows cybersecurity skills, uh, we've got also some online trainings about what we do uh, and so on. It's online times right now, so it's particularly interesting right now. And uh, you can right now, for example, register for the uh, for our course, which is a 30 days Windows security crash course. 
um, if you want to boost your knowledge with uh, our special 30 uh, cybersecurity skills, even though you are a um, cybersecurity newbie or um, especially when you are a newbie, but if you are a specialist, this is also a place for you. So please feel invited um, to check our agenda and join us within the springtime. We don't run it just like this. We only run it a couple of times per year. So that's why uh, we are mentioning this, well, which you might find uh, quite uh, interesting. And um, this is the link for, so that you are able to get um, more details about that. Please definitely check it. And eventually, um, should you be interested in specific skill or security subject, please check the uh, our our uh, concept for one day courses. And during these courses, you will be provided with eight hours of a deep deep technical content, uh, also related with forensics monitoring, uh, application white listing. So uh, really cool stuff. We are also working on a new course right now. And afterwards, you become a specialist. For example, of uh, these subjects. So it could be either forensics. So this is the link for you. So cqu.re one day forensics, or eventually we've got whitelisting mastery. This is the course that Mike is delivering and it's pretty cool forensics. I was delivering and it's a course where you are able to learn how to whitelist applications. I personally love it because this is something that I think that everybody should have in their infrastructures um both on the smaller and enterprise level and uh at the end um, the more trainings um you can find over here so we've got secureacademy.com uh cyber cyber um security training and a long story short to get slides and tools uh, you get uh you need to visit our blog for this and um if you guys have any questions um let me turn on my camera right now let's do into a little bit of a personal summary so if you guys are here that will be fantastic so to team 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 yay wow <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool okay fantastic so uh you have survived with us two hours and uh this is always like this with us so we always have something hopefully interesting to say you guys yeah, that was the, the longest uh, webinar that we have been presenting so far. So I had uh, the strongest advice. <laughs> I hope uh, that you enjoyed it as well. <laughs> I know why it's like this, by the way, because we are all in a home office and we want to like share, 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 because normally we do it in a live environment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we have plenty of time as well. <laughs> We've got plenty of time and uh, lots of interesting ideas. And before, as I mentioned before this uh, webinar, we've been testing it for like four hours and uh, everybody was preparing all the demos. So absolutely excited. And uh, thank you so much guys for joining us. Uh, if you're gonna have uh, like more questions, make sure that uh, you're gonna ask them in our blog post because this is the po this is the place where you are able to uh, share all the questions. So um, yeah. So this is this is a, a case, and we have answered uh, pretty much all the questions as well on our blog, right? Yeah. If you have any further, then there is do not hesitate to ask them on our blog or in the comment sections, uh, and uh, go also to those which we already answered there because we've been not uh, wasting time during the presentation and uh, answering them on the fly. <laughs> Okay, awesome, awesome. So, uh, so we got it. In the meantime, let me use this opportunity uh, at the same time to invite you to sign up to our other webinars and newsletter of that great portion of knowledge, uh, tools and hacks and so on. So, as always, and uh, also when it comes to um, trainings or security consulting, please remember that we are always ready uh, for you and we're always ready to take any challenge as always and uh, we are probably just an email away. So you just drop us an email, even to info at secureacademy.com or either to some of us being over here. So we've got Arthur, Miwash, Mike and Paula at secure.pl um, and uh, all of us uh, are 
connected because as we mentioned we're a geek so anyway if if you would like to keep up with what's going on at secure please check out our facebook and twitter and thanks so much for joining us today and it's an absolute pleasure uh to uh, have a chance to meet you to see you especially because we also had questions over from some of the guys that we know and uh hopefully uh see you again in the cybersecurity world and in the real world and make sure that you're gonna uh stay safe stay secure <laughs> stay secure <laughs> thank you bye thank you bye thank you. bye bye, bye, -bye.